Thank you for having us, everyone. I don't need a mic. <laughs> I do. <laughs> if uh, by slight chance my husband will start and he'll go off to the right or to the left, I'm the one that's going to bring him back. In other words, she means if I repeat myself. That's because I'm 93. You know, it's kind of hard to remember what I said a minute ago. So I hope uh, that you go along with it. <clears throat> All right, I guess you now you know who I am. All right, now I'm going to tell you who, what I, what I went through. I, my name is Aaron Greenfield, not Brenner, just in case you don't know. And uh, I am a Holocaust survivor. I come from a family of nine children, mother and father. And the only one who survived the war is myself and one sister, uh, where she died in this country, uh, very sick. She didn't work because she was crippled practically from the concentration camp. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into details, but she had swollen legs, she couldn't walk. And I don't know if we have any pictures of her here. Yeah, well, uh, I any. yeah. anyway. Uh, <clears throat> Let me, uh, let me just take a piece of paper here, just in case. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, I, I do, my wife told me to take this with me because I repeat myself many times. So that's why she's my uh, boss over here telling me what to do. <laughs> okay. Um, I grew up in a Polish town in Poland. And uh, when I was three years old, I went to a Jewish kindergarten. I already wore a kippah on my head. My parents were very religious, like most of people in Poland, 80, 90% of them. And I went to a, a Jewish kindergarten. And when, and, I, and at that time, and also after, I went, after, after that, I went to Polish school, to a school, public school, which was basically about 80% non-Jews and about 20% Jewish. But we went to a school which was actually a Christian school, a Catholic school, because there were, it was a small town, and uh, I went all the way to the, fifth or sixth grade, I had a hard time making all the way because of trouble. Hitler started to send propaganda into Poland. And every time I came out of school, I was beaten up by non-Jews, of course, because young people swallow everything they hear, what they read in the headlines. And the headlines will go after the Jews because they are your misfortune. They are the ones, if it wouldn't be for them, you would, everybody would be fine. So the Poles, many of them collaborated with them. The ones that didn't understand what was going on, didn't understand what he's up to. So it just goes to the point where when you come to a country and you want, you want to swallow it up, you go after the ones that are not the majority, the minority. So you go after them, then the rest of them leave them alone so they can do whatever they want to. Anyway, I don't want to go into politics, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to read it. Yeah. I'm going to read it because I, this is a testimony that I gave the New England diplomat Seder. You know what Seder is for Passover? which was done for many diplomats from, from America, in America, and it was done in the, um, in the uh, JFK Library in, Bo in Boston. And I was invited to speak over there, and this is the speech that I gave. I'm going to read it a little bit because I think it'll be much easier. Anyway, my name is Aaron Greenfield. I grew up in a small Polish town. Okay, let me go to... July 
39, I became Bar Mitzvah. You know what that is? I suppose you do. In Jewish tradition, this meant I became a man. However, my childhood truly um, ended two months later when the German army rolled in into Poland. One day, the whole town was told to get, the whole town was told together to see a hanging of my friend Aaron Diamant. And they hung him because he bought some coals from a Polish man that the Polish man stole the coals and sold it to him. The Polish man was also hung, believe it or not. And he was not a German, he was not a, 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 a Jew. And they hung him, and his name was Aaron Diamant. And I, and I happened to have a job in the clean the uh, barracks of the Germans, which was not too far from the hanging. They called the whole town out to see what they do to somebody that doesn't obey orders. And they hung him, and I can remember when he said the last statement, they asked him, what would you like to say before we hang you? And he said in, in Hebrew, uh, Shema Israel, which means, hear God, and God is the only God, and so forth and so on. And they hung him. Uh, in 1939, well, anyway, well, you know, in July of 1939, I became Bar Mitzvah. Okay, all right. So, uh, let, let me just go on. Yeah. I, I became Bar Mitzvah, and I was supposed to go to the temple, and the temple was already burned the, before the Germans came in, because the collaborators that waited for the Germans to march in helped. They burned the temple, so I had no bar mitzvah. So I went home and ran for my life, not to be beaten up and all that. And the temple was burned after that anyway. Next thing was every Jewish family had to stay in the house, what they call a, um, what do you say? In other words, you can only go out an hour a day in the morning and an hour a day in the evening to go get your food with the stamps that they give you, which was half the amount of anybody else. So we were not allowed to get out. Uh, only you were allowed to go in. You were allowed to go outside. You, you had to go outside to go to work. In uh, yeah, and then, well, yeah, then in, in September, I mean, when it, get, when it got dark, and it was already in January, my, my brothers decided, myself and two more brothers, older brothers, decided we were going to quietly go to the countryside. We knew a Polish woman that was a friend of ours, and also a customer of, of my parents. And she was a nice woman, and she said, and we knew we could get milk for the baby because my little sister was only five years old and she needed milk. So we decided to leave about three o'clock in the morning through the woods so nobody would catch us in the snow. And on the way back, I just got to get to the, we carried the milk, me and two older brothers, and through the woods so they wouldn't catch us. In the meantime, somebody must have squealed that they saw us. The Germans caught all three of us, brought us to a gymnasium, to a gym, where they have fun doing exercises. And they called the whole town to see what should they do to a Jew when he doesn't obey orders. And they started to beat my brother, my two brothers, with whips with a whip, like you, for what you use for, use for a dog or a lion, whatever. And for a half an hour, I told them to exercise this. They stripped him half naked, you know, and they beat him for half an hour straight. They were bleeding on the back, practically. And they didn't do it to me because a German, the Polish woman was a neighbor of ours, and she had a boyfriend, which was a German, 
she asked him not to hurt me because I was so young. I was only 13 and skinny, you know, uh, bones because we didn't have any food. So they, they had me watch and my brothers were beaten. Anyway, I'm not going to go into more. After, after that, uh, further down, uh, a few months later, like after the winter, like in the fall, in the, in the, in the spring of 1940. No, it was still in the winter time. In the winter, you yeah. Were, uh, at home, and uh, your brother and your father, and you went to shoveling snow. In yeah, the well, I'm just going to say that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, in the winter time, we, we had to shovel snow. And any time that a drunken uh, soldier, a German soldier, had a to have fun, he came in and just like, with no questions asked, everybody out of bed, lined everybody up. He was drunk like anything, and another soldier with him. And they beat up my father. He was bleeding all over. The kids started to scream and cry. And they said, if they don't shut up, I'm going to shoot them all. There was a soldier, just a, a, a regular soldier, just having fun. <clears throat> uh, we had to look at that. And we were basically scared to death. We were already living in your house, in the house, did I mention two hours a day, in the morning, yeah. an hour, an hour in the evening. And during the day, we shoveled snow. So the, the, the German tanks could go back and forth, or just elevated the, all the tank, I mean the trucks and so forth. And then you go back to the house. And after that, during the day, all the, so, all the stores that the, Jew, the Jewish people had on the street were taken over by a collaborator, could have been a Pole, that, that was a collaborator with the Germans, or a German took over the store and said, you are not the boss anymore. Then, in other words, he would walk into my store and say to me, you're going to work for this guy, and you don't own it anymore. Forget it. And you better behave yourself or we shoot you and your whole family. Anyway, I have to go on okay. further. Yes. And just and tell them about the, um, about the ghetto. The, uh, not the ghetto, the, yeah, the, yeah. the ghetto. Uh, after that, we were told, uh, like in 1941, uh, we were all told to, uh, they called everybody, tell them, everybody out, you have a little, just take a little bag on your shoulders, uh, on your back, and take your possessions and come outside leave the furniture, take it out, and put it outside. So anybody that's not Jewish or whatever could take whatever they want to. And so we took everything out and they told you to take everything on your back, whatever your possessions are. And you walk, we walked three miles, three kilometers rather, to a new place. My home was gone. Somebody else, they gave it to somebody else, to a non Jew or whatever. <clears throat> and we walked about three kilometers, which is like two miles or so, with whatever possessions we had with us. And we went to a ghetto, which was emptied out a whole bunch of uh, small houses. They pushed in about three or four families into a place half of this. And Poland families were like nine children, some of them five children, who slept on tables on the floor and hardly any food. We got rations, a piece of bread, enough for a, a couple of bites, Not, no milk for the children or nothing. Slept on the floor. Uh, it, well, yeah, it was slept all over the floor. I slept on the floor, the tables, wherever you could, because that's how we lived for about nine months. And it, it was it, when they said later on, uh, they, oh yeah, while I was there, 
During the day, I worked in a tannery, cleaning the blood of the, of the cows and all that stuff. And then I worked in a bakery for a while. And I just want to tell you, the hunger was so great. I worked in a bakery, and the baker there didn't, he didn't, he was not a German, but I stole the bread, which is about three pounds, the bread is big, and I put it on my stomach and covered it up to bring it back to the house so that my brothers and sisters, in the ghetto, the house, in the ghetto, in the thing, where everybody said, I brought it in and, and that's how we lived, we were starving to death. Then when they said concentration camp, it didn't matter anymore because it couldn't be any worse. Uh, we were hungry, and so I remember that bread when I stole, and the kids were outside, and I started to eat the bread, and my mother said, you're hungry, eat, eat, go ahead and eat. I ate about, oh, I would say, two pounds of bread while I was sitting. I mean, that's how hunger was. No butter, no nothing, just bread and water. And I felt so guilty because I, I didn't leave anything for the kids, for my brothers and sisters. My mother looked at me and she said to me, when I begged you to eat when you were little, I had to pay you to eat. Mm -hmm. And now you ate the bread like you never saw bread before. Mm -hmm. Just go to show. You'll be surprised what you can eat when you're hungry. Uh, uh, then, all of a sudden, one day, they, well, I'm, I'm scaring, skipping a lot because there's so much more to say. One day they came and they said, everybody outside. We already knew the situation. When they say that, it means a selection. And women and children on one side, men and young women on the other. A woman and children and then men, well anyway, they picked later on the woman. And there was a selection. By that time I meant to tell you, my brother, three brothers were already in the concentration camp. I forgot, didn't get to that. And my father was in the concentration camp already. And my uh, sister and myself, and the rest of the little kids were in line for the selection. And my mother said to me, I was skinny because starving, and uh, I had short pants on. She says, put on long pants. She knew it's a selection. If you look young, they're going to put you to the left side, and you're going to go to Auschwitz, and they're going to just you know, get rid of you, dispose of you, perfect. I mean, period, that's it. So she said, put on long pants, and she said, when they ask you how old you are, tell them you're 16, not 15. Because a friend of mine was a little dinner, you know, very th I, have a, I had a round face, so I looked stronger. And they told him to the, go to the left, they told me to go to the right, because I told him I was 16, I was only 15. So I went from there to, the, to that side, and I never saw my, I never saw my parents again, because I went one, my sister was older, and she went also to the right, because she was old enough, so she went to another concentration camp. And by the way, she lived in this country, and I'm going to away from the subject because I remember when I was liberated and I came home, I came to find her and I found her. I couldn't recognize her. She was a, I don't, do we have pictures of her over here? No. Well, I don't have them with me. Oh, you didn't, yeah. Uh, she was a very good looking woman and strong and she uh, was, uh, when, when I came and I found her that she's alive, and I came in after the war and to find her, and I walked in and I looked at her and I couldn't believe it's my sister. 
she had no teeth because she, in Poland, if you had a problem with teeth, they sometimes gave it silver or gold teeth, you know, uh, uh, instead of Boston, you know. So the Germans took it out, they needed it for the war. So there's a woman, 19 years old, when she was, you know, um, when she uh, was not 19 or well, whatever, the point is that they took all, all the teeth out and her feet were bleed, bleeding, swollen, and I, I couldn't recognize her, that's how bad she was. No teeth, no teeth at all, completely. Just all to gone. go back, because my husband skipped that, yeah. uh, when the lines, they were, had three lines. So one was for the young people that were going to go into concentration work camps. Then there were young women that whatever the Germans wanted and the families with mothers were on another line. And all these children, anything under, went right directly to the gas chambers and were eliminated. In, Auschwitz. Yeah. in Auschwitz. So they were just eliminating <clears throat> all the babies with mothers and whatever. So those that survived and went to work, that's another story. But that's what happened to his family. You know? Okay. Then uh, the first camp he went to was a fertilizer camp. Yeah. It was anyway, toxic. The first camp was actually in Poland, but the Germans took it over. It was a... a uh, place where they do, where they uh, produce fertilizer for the farms and stuff like that. <clears throat> it was, you know, the Germans had a mask to work with, uh, not the Germans, or other people, Polish people. The, we didn't do, we, we, I was completely black from the dust and the dirt from it. And many of us got swollen completely. Some kids yeah. were, they, they went to, to bed uh, uh, like s skeletons, and they woke up in the morning completely swollen from that dust and all that. So basically, what <laughs> if you couldn't go to work, they just shoot you, and that was the end of it. A friend of mine was shot right in front of me. Uh, and I was lucky, I didn't, didn't, uh, didn't bother me, evidently, and I was shipped to another camp. I was in nine camps. The other camp I worked building roads most of the time, digging ditches. Detmar. And and hmm? Yeah. The death march. The well, death march. Yeah, well it was a death march, but it was it was not exactly. It was going from one camp to another and if you couldn't work they shot you. So it was I was lucky, I was strong enough to survive it. But many of us were not, did not survive. I went, the kids I went to school with, they were shot to death or they died from starvation. One of them, a friend of mine, he woke up in the morning, he was twice the size. He was completely swollen because the Germans that worked over there, or others, or non-Germans, but not Jewish, they had a mask to, to, um, survive, to be able to withstand the dust. But uh, it wasn't important with them what happens to me. It's easier to kill you go to the next. Uh, anyway, I went through from one camp to another. The second camp, another, let's, I'm going to go to the fifth camp. I slept on the top of a garage, and like on a, some kind of a building. It was in the winter time, it was so cold. We slept on, on the. <coughs> bunk beds, one tree, in, uh, tree high. And one night, we had, we had no mattress, it just straw, a, like a bag from, a potato bag with straw, and we slept on that. <clears throat> but, um, there were no covers. No covers, it was cold in the winter time. It was a garage, an old garage that we slept in. So one kid uh, urinated during the night, he was, it was cold or whatever, I mean, they were all young kids, young people. And it went through my bed and another bed through, through the other one got wet. It went all the way down. Well, nobody wanted to tell who did it. 
So 20 of us were in that section, like in a place like this here, or the garage, or what the, the size of that, or maybe bigger, some kind of a building, whatever. <clears throat> and so, so who did it? Nobody wanted to say. So uh, nobody said to 20 of us were in that section, all of us got 25 lashes on a bear behind. You're completely black and blue, and no matter what, the next day you go to work. And we didn't know who did it, and they said they could care less. And this was also done, I just want you to know, by people that tried, tried to survive, and they were called the Kapo concentration camp police. It could have been a, another Jewish guy, but he had to do, he had his job just to survive. So he had to do it under their command. And uh, so we were black and blue. The next day we had to go to work anyway. The next camp I came to, I'm going to go to the one that's important where I met my brothers that were already in camp before. And they didn't know I was alive even. I came to a big camp called Anyway, it doesn't matter, German name. Uh, that camp was a very large camp. And I met my brothers there, which was very good. They were happy to, they didn't know I was alive. They figured I was killed in Auschwitz. And they were in fairly good shape, but also sick and odd. So they were glad to see me that I'm alive. And I told them that the whole pa family perished. They didn't know. And they, we took care of each other, but I was so weak already by then, they came and made a selection in that camp. And I was among the selection. That means I'm going to Auschwitz or another camp of destruction, or dis of uh, disposal, as they say. And they picked me out and they set their ending. And they told me, they picked me out and said, go on the train. I couldn't get up because I was so, I probably weighed about, I don't know, uh, 40, 50 pounds, I don't know, a kilogram, whatever. I was a, a complete skeleton. I couldn't get up anymore on the stairs, so they pushed me up. So my brother saw me going up into the train and they cried and they figured they'll never see me again. I'm going to Auschwitz. I went from there, at that time, 43, 44, the Germans started to get problems winning the war. So they shipped me to a camp where I, do, I did a very easy job to push um, uh, what they call um, bullets, the powder into the bullets, which was a sitting down job. Oh, I, I don't remember exactly what I did, but it was a sitting down job because I couldn't do anything hard work, but they couldn't, couldn't afford to lose the labor for free. So that was my job. So they never gave me any uh, cover, cover to, for the powder that I shouldn't get sick. They could care less. The Germans were sitting there. Many of them, they're not, not Germans, but uh, whatever. They, were, they had a mask, something, not me. I got, got completely yellow from that powder. And, but it was an easy job. Then the second job I got was also uh, do a, a river on tanks. I did it was my fifth camp already. I, by that time I, I was separated from my brothers. I didn't see them. I didn't know what happened to them. It was already 1944 or something. 40, 43, I don't know, in the middle of, maybe the end of 43. I just want to tell you a story. When I came to that camp, they started to bring in Jews from Belgium and Holland and others that were heavy and well fed because they didn't know what, what it means to have Hitler in, in their country. And they were so, and so, I have to tell you that story because just to, so you would understand what it means. 
that the people that are not hungry do not understand the people that are hungry. So one day, that the first day they always did, they didn't want to scare them, so they gave a good dinner, a good soup, that Sunday afternoon, and we, which is a day off, and we're sitting on the grass at the outside, and he comes, many Jews from Hungary and Holland and others, and with big bellies, very well to do, probably very educated, couldn't speak Yiddish, Jewish, or, or any other language except their own language. But I, I spoke uh, German pretty well, so I, when they spoke Dutch, I could understand what they're saying. And so I sit there and I said to myself, I was like a dog waiting for a, a, a bone. I figured they will never eat that food. And to me this was a steak because it was a good soup for that day. And I figured they're probably not going to eat it. They're going to throw out the potatoes and I'll grab it. And it's exactly what I did. And one, when I walked over and picked that potato up, I baked a, a, a cooked potato and started to eat. And one said to the other, look at that guy. I, I, like I'm a pig. And one of the Holland, Holland Jews understood German, which I spoke fluently. So I said, what did he say? He called you a Polish Jewish swine. Okay. I said, anyway, so I told him tomorrow he'd be doing the same thing. If not tomorrow, maybe a day after. What happened to those people, they were very well-to-do people, very rich from whatever, they took them to their homes and wound up in there. They started to beat them up, they didn't know how to use a shovel, they didn't, they were not used to that kind of stuff. They were dying left and right. And, and I looked and I said to myself, I knew this was coming. That was my fifth camp already or something like that. <coughs> the next... Uh, I I just want you to know I'll let, if I'll be glad to stop for a while if you wanted to ask questions but I'm not gonna not yet but I'll let you just finish this yeah. Well, this is the one. Yeah. yeah. See this piece of paper I spoke in the. Um, you told him. I told him. Yeah. So I'm trying to, because my wife keeps telling me that I don't, I forget what I'm talking about, and I repeat myself too much. Well, I tell uh, everybody here that when so, you come to the store, so, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, I do because I'm I'm 93. So, what do you want? <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> at the last concentration camp was called Gurlitz. That morning, uh, they take, we took long marches to a place. No, we took long marches because the Allies, or the, the Russian front, was moving. And they kept, every time the Russian front moved forward, they took us out because they didn't want to lose the, the free labor because they had to build, you know, ammunition and stuff like that to fight the war. And by that time, we saw many, Russian soldiers on trains, uh, I mean German soldiers on trains from the Russian front, frozen feet and frozen legs, which we're glad to see because the war is coming to an end, more or less. But that was in, in uh, December, January of 44 already, you know. So, um, 44? 1944, the Americans started bombing. Yeah. In 1944, the, well, the Russians were bombing, the, 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 the Americans were bombing too. We would, no, they were not bombing our camp. No. The Russians were bombing our camp. But we saw, when I, we were working outside, every time we looked up, exactly at one o'clock, we saw American planes coming, going towards Dresden, a large city you probably know. And it was bombed to hell. I mean, it was. And we saw that, and every time we did this, 
We said, oh my God, it's coming to an end. And somebody said to me, don't be so sure. They may make an end of us before they do this, you know. And they were doing it. At that time, every time the Russian front met, met for, uh, came forward, they didn't want to lose us, so they took us out. This is very important. What happened, <clears throat> they took us from the camp to a uh, farm, uh, and we slept in a, in a, in a barn to, until, the, until the Russian front was pushed back, then they brought us back. So we stayed on that place for two days with starvation, and we slept in, a, in barns that the Russians, the Germans escaped and left it behind. So we slept in barns. Now in the barns, it was so crowded, even in that barn, it was, I slept, and somebody slept and, and used my stomach as a pillow on my stomach, and I slept and put my head on somebody else's stomach. Just to give you an idea how bad it was for the people, I was in fairly good shape at the time because I forgot I had to go back to that story. But I, so I woke up in the morning, I, my head was on somebody's stomach when I woke up in the morning, the man was dead. And the first thing kids like you would ask me, very, or people would say, so what did you do? Well, I, the first thing I did, is I stole the shoes. Does it make sense? No. It does, huh? Okay. Uh, because I needed my shoes, because my shoes, I was already barefoot, it's winter, you know. <clears throat> and um, on the way back, I came back to the camp and I found a job. This is why I survived. Mm -hmm. Infirmary. In the infirmary? Yeah. No. No, I found, I, in the, I found it. Actually, what happened, I forgot to say this, why I survived. Uh, this is an interesting story. <clears throat> Before I went on those marches, I was in the camp, and one day I decided not to go to work. And the roll call came, and they were looking for me. And I said, I don't care if they catch me, maybe they shoot me, but at the end of me, of me I was already half dead. But I, I, but I noticed that the guy that is in charge, which was a German criminal from before the war, they said that he killed his own grandmother, whatever it is, and he killed other people. And he was in charge of, of the killing, more or less. So he, so I, I noticed him, and we had to go to roll call every morning. And then he showed up, they were looking for me. So I found that he was crazy, that he was a little bit, like he keeps yelling, but he doesn't know what he's doing. So I figured him out. I said, I'm going to do something. I don't care if they kill me, that's fine. I stayed home instead of showing up. And I grabbed a, a broom and I started to sweep the uh, st stairs of a, of a kitchen nearby. Because I figured if I do this here and if I get the job, I tell him he, he's confused anyway. So he passed by, I told him, you told me to sweep the kitchen, the yeah. stairs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I said that. So that gave me a chance to go into the kitchen when the, the uh, cooks were uh, sleeping. I stole potatoes <coughs> out of the kettle, and I started to gain weight because I had the food. And next morning, I didn't show up again. They were looking for me, and that guy was crazy. So I passed by me. I work over here, this is my job. Okay, hit me with a whip, and I kept going. I started to gain weight because I had food that I stole in the kitchen when they were sleeping, and I gained weight. I started to run a business, basically. I started to sell the potatoes that I stole out of the cattle, 
to people that wanted it, and I sold it for cigarettes. Nobody had money, but everybody got 10 cigarettes a month, and I did too, and I didn't smoke. So I said, give me a cigarette. So I said, but I don't smoke. But I can sell to an idiot that wants to smoke. And he give me his bread, So which I did. So I started to run a small business. So I had cigarettes, and the cigarettes I sold for bread, and the bread I sold for soup. And slowly, and I got the job in the kitchen, uh, washing dirty lice from the clothes in the, in the washing machine, whatever it is. Wow. Point is, I was there nearby. Yeah, wow. No, I mean not washing machine, <laughs> uh, cattles. Tubs. Tubs. So, uh, anyway, so I uh, started to gain weight. This is how I survived the war, because I, I was strong enough to walk on the death march. And on the death march, in the, and then later on the death march came, and so forth. And I told you about that anyway, so. Yeah, but the last one that um, the Nazis knew that the Russians were coming in, and um, the death march was of 6,000. Yeah, 6,000. 6,000. And who, they left the guerrillas camp, and 2,000 of them died. And within, they were shot. within two months. No, not only shot, they died of, they, they, if you anymore. couldn't walk anymore, they shot you anyway, so. A friend of mine, I held on to him. He couldn't walk anymore. I just want to tell you, a, a nun, uh, he was not a German, he was a collaborator, a Ukrainian, or, or whatever. And he said to him, walk faster, and he hit him. And I held on to him, and then he couldn't walk anymore. He pushed him down a, a thing, he just got killed and never been. So uh, out of 6,000 in, in that camp, the last camp, 2,000 were killed within two months, starvation, beatings, and so forth and so on. And shootings. And shootings. Uh, finally, uh, I, I was then, then uh, when we came back, by, by that time the Russians were already pushing hard and they were taken over, and the Germans escaped. And then they said, all of a sudden, they probably live next door, they probably live next door to you in America. Who knows? Because they escaped and they wound up whatever. Uh, they just went to the American zone, and because they knew the Russians would probably take care of them, but would not take any pity on them because the Americans didn't feel it. The Russians felt it. They were starving and they were taken over. Um, part of Russia was taken over by the Germans and they were also uh, suffering. So they took revenge. But the Americans didn't understand it. And I don't blame them because you don't understand unless you live it. So anyway, uh, what else can I say? Uh, yeah, and his brothers. The two, the, the oldest brothers, um, two weeks before the war was over, at that point, the Germans didn't care because they knew they lost the war. So they went to different camps and were shooting everybody so that the, they wouldn't, they, when the Americans and the Russians would come in, they wouldn't find anybody alive. Uh, my brothers, I found out, were still alive. In, Until two weeks before. In, uh, about two weeks before the war ended. I was the unlucky one in a way in comparison to others. Auschwitz was liberated in, in January of 1945 and everybody was free. I was still between 19, uh, January 45 to the end of May, to the beginning of May. Uh, 15,000 Jews. My brothers were there too in that place, in that camp, were shot to death and killed, or, or whatever they did. They, they were still alive because somebody told me, and they killed so many people. And uh, so I'm lucky to, to stay alive. If anyone has any questions, please ask, because it's easier for him to um, give you answers. 
Karen, I know that after the, the Americans didn't expect to find what they found mm -hmm. in the concentration camps. How did, what happened when they opened the gates and said, okay, you're gone, you're free, where did you go next? Oh yeah, okay, the Americans did not liberate me. Uh, unfortunately, I was liberated by the Russians, which was, uh, they didn't have much either, so if I got something, they stole it from me, so. Uh, <laughs> If the Americans, the Americans were going around with chocolates and cigarettes, and I uh, got myself a bike after the war because the Germans escaped, and the Russians said, get off that bike. I said, why don't you go get another bike from somebody else? You go get it, because they didn't have much. You see, it, it's different. When you liberate, uh, I don't blame the Russians, you know, it's, it's a different situation. So uh, that was uh, not, uh, not very good, but... But anyway, when I was liberated by the Russians, I, I took a freight train to go back to Poland because I had no money and the freight train, they let you go on it. And then it was tough because on the freight train, if you have any possessions that are worth something that you organized after the war because the places were empty, like the Germans escaped, I, I had a, a watch and uh, uh, on the Russian uh, on the Russian train, when I when I went to Poland, the, ja the the Russian took it away from me. He said, "Go get another one somewhere else." You know, like that, because they didn't much either. So uh, it took me about three days to go 150 kilometers to Poland on freight trains. And they let me free, you know, because they, it was not you didn't pay, so you had to. So I slept on freight trains, but I had food. To me, this was paradise, I mean, in comparison. <coughs> so when I came back to Poland, I came into my little town in Poland. I just want to tell you what caused anti-Semitism in a way. A Polish kid that went to school with me, a Christian, you know, Poly a Catholic, and I got onto the train, he came into the train station and he was there, he looked at me, my God, you goddamn Jew, you're still alive. I said to myself, it's too bad that Russia didn't stay a little longer in Poland. I'm sorry to say that, but that's, that's exactly what I felt. It's not the whole Polish people front, the, poor, the, the problem is that People sometimes, the Polish people are angry because the concentration camps were built in Poland. Because Germany knew that Poland will cooperate, it, will cooperate. I mean, co cooperate rather. And that's the problem with the world. We don't think it's going to happen to you, so you don't help anybody. And you better open your eyes because you never know if tomorrow it's going to be you. So keep that in mind. So stick together. That's all I can tell you. Anyway, that's where he met his sister. Oh yeah. And, and from there, what happened, they traveled mm -hmm. through different countries and, you know, and ended up in Austria. Yeah. No. As a DP camp, displaced person camp. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, but, which was, there was paradise in a way. I mean, that's... Uh, it was. I mean, we get three meals a day and I didn't do anything. As a matter of fact, I, I was not under the American, I was under the Russians uh, at that time in Austria because that, that part of Austria was under the Russians. But later on, I uh, uh, wound up in, in the American zone. But, uh, no, the, the, no, in Austria it was a very American, American <coughs> woman, yeah, in Poland was under the Russian. I, 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 I traveled, I escaped from Poland after the war, smuggled the border, and the Polish border, I called, Polish, Polish, Russian, well, was Russian were there, to Czechoslovakia, and I was arrested with my sister, and my brother-in-law, she was already married at the time. By the way, I'm, I did I tell you that, uh, tell him about uh, how my sister looked? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. was the first thing. So we traveled 
trying to go get to the American zone because from Russia you had to buy your way out. So we went to the Russian border, I mean to the Czech border, and we were arrested, which was no big deal. They gave me three meals a day. I did nothing. So they knew what I was doing. And I told them, so they told us, if they ask you, why are you here in Czechoslovakia? Why did you smuggle the border from Poland? I had to, and Poland was a German, I mean, it was a Russian uh, border. So everybody, it was a very, uh, there was an underground, a Jewish underground, that was paying off some of the people on the border. So they said, take some whiskey with you, the Russians, like whiskey, whatever, and open the gate. I have nothing. You want to take the whiskey? Take it. So they let you go to check to, and so they went to Czechoslovakia. We were arrested in Czechoslovakia for about eight days. But this was a pleasure because they gave us three meals a day. To me, this was nothing, you know. <coughs> and uh, they asked for proper. They asked me how I liked uh, Poland under the Russians and all that, uh, so I knew that they want to hear that they are better, better Russian, they are better communists than the others. So I told him, Poland is bad, but it was expensive, this is bad, that's bad, that's why I ran away and came here. And they wanted to hear that, they had to put it in the paper, could, I could care less. By that time, <coughs> they let us out and they told us, uh, you can go, so we said, we had to say, we go on to uh, Palestine, to, you know, to Greece, to I have Israel. Come, Israel, whatever. And it was a very organized that we were told what to say in order to let us go. There was a time when they told us, don't talk, just tell him, you're from Greek, you're Greek, because we had to smuggle the border from one country to another in the, in the, under, the, under the Russian uh, mm -hmm. hold. So anyway, it took, my, it took us about two, three weeks and we got to the American zone in Austria. And in Austria we had a speech made by a German, uh, by the uh, American general, I forgot his name, and he told us you're free and you're going to be divided to go to another town and a uh, displaced person camp and I stayed in Austria for about uh, three years from 1945 or 45 to, to, 40, to 49 and uh, then I applied to come to America. I had actually relatives in America and they guaranteed for me and then it was tough. I had to wait three years with all the guarantees and everything else that I will not be a, a, a problem that I will ask for welfare or anything like that. Still, I take me three years to come to America. So I just want to tell you, people complain, oh, this and that. We had, I had no little children, I had no problems, I had two hands and two feet, I could work, and still, I had to wait so long to come to America. And in 1949, in January, I came to America. And, uh, and I came to, uh, to uh, what's that? Yeah, yeah I, came, uh, I came with a boat. She, she's jealous because my boat was nicer than hers. <laughs> <laughs> it was, he came on a luxury boat. I came to this country on a army boat. Mm -hmm. It was the last army ship that left and took us well, the, um, because we were in DP camps and displaced person camps in Germany, you know. So they took us on an army and we came to Ellis Island. I did. Mm -hmm. yeah. But he, no, of course not. <laughs> yeah. Luxury. That's the first time. On the boat, I, I saw an orange, you know. Oh, and then I saw oranges in Poland. There was a saying among the Jewish people, because they were, many, uh, they were poor, and they said, a Jewish poor man eats an orange, either he's sick or the, or orange. the orange is sick. <laughs> because a good one he can't afford. 
you know, the oranges don't grow in Poland. You have to get them from Italy and stuff like that. So. Any, any questions? Yes, I have a question. In 2017, in Charlottesville, Virginia, yeah. neo-Nazi and Holocaust protesters led to violence. And after that event, the President of the United States said that there were, quote, good people oh, yeah. on both sides. Definitely. Absolutely. As a Holocaust survivor, what was your reaction to the President of the United States My praising, praising neo-Nazis? Yeah. My reaction is very simple. It is the, the uh, country that has, it depends what they think. In other words, my reaction is not, I'm not surprised either, because a politician, if they let him get away too far, and he will do almost anything to become president. So therefore, you've got to be very careful what you do and when you vote. Now, if Trump were to run again, I didn't want to mention his name exactly, but anyway, I'm not sure how it's going to play out. It could be that he may become the best president ever. But if he has to be re-elected, and if chances are that he has no chance to win, he'll do almost anything. If he has to sacrifice you or me or anybody, he will do it. And that's what it is all about. It's not the country. It's the the ism, the the, the ism that the uh, socialism or communism or what ism you want that that runs the country. And in this country, so far, we have free speech, and we can vote them out and vote them in. So when you vote, better look not at the back page of the sports. Read the front page, do me a favor, and read the articles. Know what's, what can happen, because if you sleep, as they say, in your own pants, and you don't wake up, you know, it can happen to you too. If the Polish government, the Polish people in Poland, would not be also, see, propaganda can do a lot. The Polish people, in 1936, there was a, a there was a uh, a, uh, a president in 19, 1936 that died. His name was Joseph Piłsudski. He was very good to Poland and to the Jewish people in Poland, and everything was fine. The minute he died, somebody else took over. And he became the best friend for the Nazis. And he never knew what the Nazis will do with Poland. Of course not. But he looked out for himself. See? So he sacrificed. Uh, by that 1936-37, you already had an open door for the Germans to walk in. The Poles were ready to give away every Jew that they had. You see, it's, it's anti-Semitism. It's not, I don't want to preach about it, but it's a, it's a sickness that you do to divide and conquer, you know. And I want to tell you something, as a, I read a lot, I said to myself, in Poland, the Jews were very religious. Do you know why? Because those, the Poles did not accept them very well. In Germany, the German Jews were disappearing, intermarrying. When, they, when, German, when Hitler marched in, they didn't even know they were Jewish. Hitler told them, your grandfather was Jewish. You go into Auschwitz, distribute, dispose of. So I want you to know what it is, what, what, what it is when, when you deal with a, 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 a country that's being, being overtaken by another power. What can happen to you? You've got to be very careful and watch your watch your ways. If things start I don't know turning. If he, uh, answered your question or not? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. I don't know if they would understand what I'm saying. Does it matter? Yes. Can you describe how you felt your joy when 
the you know the instant when you knew that it was over when you were in the last camp? What, you know, how, did how, did you, yeah, how did that come about? And then the second question is, once you got to this country, how did you get to Norwood? And the life that we know you today. You went question. on the wrong boat. No. <laughs> The first question is, yeah. how did you feel when you were liberated? How did I feel? Yeah. Confused, very happy, and you know, we were dancing in, I mean, in, in the middle of the place, and we saw the Germans that were watching us were scared, and all of a sudden they called us our friends. Before I was a dirty Jew. All of a sudden I was his friend, because he was afraid that we were going to attack him, but we were not the type, we were just glad to to stay alive, and they escaped, of course, to the American zone, but the Germans, the Germans uh, knew better. Speak a little back. Yeah, because they escaped to the American zone, because if they go into the Russian zone, they'll be caught and wound up in Siberia. The second question the gentleman yeah. had, how did you get to Norway? How did I get to Norway? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's a very interesting, you, you may, Glad, yeah, well, I was a fact, I'm glad you mentioned that. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, when I came to this country, I worked very hard in a meat packing place called Bust Boston Sausage. Uh, maybe you ever heard of it? Yes. Colonial yes. Provision, yes. Boston yes. Sausage, something like that. I wrapped hands, kosher hands, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and, and that was my thing. And I tried a few too. So. <laughs> I just want you to know. And I made <coughs> union wages. It was owned by a Jewish guy. And the, the guy that was in charge, the foreman, the main foreman, was a Polish Catholic, which could hardly speak English, but he was a good foreman. I mean, he was somebody that has found a way how to make the ham way more and therefore he had the job, and he had a lot to say. I couldn't get a job there, even the owner yeah, was a water. The owner was a Jew, and I couldn't get a job. There were not more than five of us there that could, and I was wrapping hams all day. And I, I, I worked with a, uh, a guy that they gave me a job to work with a guy that was uh, putting the cartons together like on a machine, and I was helping him. And he happened to be a, a, a black man, a black guy, very short but very strong. And so I helped him, whatever he did, I pushed it together and all that. I couldn't speak English. I was only uh, nine months in this country. I spoke a little bit, but not much. But I spoke German, so I could understand English quicker than others did. And so he was reading a book. And I said, what are you doing? Study. He says, I'm an amateur actor, he said. And I study the lines. You can help me. Read my lines. Read those lines to me. And I'll... I said, I, I can't read English. So when I read English to him, and he was very good in English because he was an actor, so he used to say, Aaron, he used to hit me. He was very strong but short. He said, Aaron, you enunciate. You pronounce the so, so I learned from him, I, from him how to speak English the correct way. And so he said, do it this way or that way. And one day I came in and I had a watch on my hand, a Ben Ross watch, it's an interesting story, speaking of why I'm in a business, you know. <clears throat> I, uh, I was already doing business in, this, in, a, in, the, in the camp, selling